Hey, this is Dr. Alex Vincent, Executive Client Partner at LHH. If you are wanting to learn how to embrace change and navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to the Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, Dennis Giannoutsis. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey, welcome to the show, Leadership is Changing. What we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Leaders everywhere confront similar obstacles because people are people, but everywhere you go, leaders are overwhelmed, disrupted, and under pressure. They run from email to email, meeting to meeting. Many leaders are not changing quick enough, which means they run the risk of becoming irrelevant and being left behind. The purpose of the show is to take our listeners' leadership to another level by finding their balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. I believe we don't have enough effective leaders in the world today, and if we can get the leaders to step up and lead change, then they can inspire real change. It is now time to adapt in our fast-moving world. And listeners, today I have a guest. His name is Alex Vincent. And Dr. Alex Vincent is the Global Executive Client Partner for LHH, developing solutions to maximize team performance and to transform organizational leadership cultures. Employing an array of groundbreaking research, compelling keynotes and dynamic workshops, Alex has traveled the globe to help leaders and teams from a wide array of industries and sectors. Alex, hey, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Dennis. Great to be with you uh, today. Yeah, wonderful. So, hey, Alex, I've just done a brief introduction on you. Love to know a little bit more about your background. Yeah, happy to happy to share a little bit of my journey. So I'll go back to, to many years ago. So I graduated with a PhD in experimental psychology from the U- University of Toronto. So I guess part of my background is that I'm Canadian. So I'll put that on the table right up front. And what I was doing at that point, I was studying the human brain. I was studying the visual system. I was studying the memory system. I was studying different systems of the brain. So I was actually doing science. So I was working as a t- scientist, analyzing the, the brain, how it works, and then publishing in academic journals and lecturing. So that's that's sort of when I got exposed to these concepts of psychology, how the mind works, mindset, all of those kinds of things. So I would say that was an early exposure to that. But really on the on the high technical side, so my colleagues were engineers, physicists. My first boss was a physicist who studied with Nobel laureates in physics. So I got kind of that leadership exposure, which was which was really formative in the early days. So I went from that to actually joining the federal government and then started to manage research projects. And these started to take on larger and larger scopes. So going from being a scientist to managing research projects and being more of a manager of stakeholders and consultants who were doing the actual technical work, right? So I started to get to the managing of projects, the managing of budgets, influencing stakeholders to kind of support what we were doing. And then I went from that to managing a team of scientists. And so went from one federal department to another federal department. In this case, it was Environment Canada, where the team of scientists, so world-renowned specialists, all PhDs in their fields studying climate change. And they were studying the impact of climate change on a particular ecosystem here in Canada. And that really exposed me to managing a team of leaders because these were leaders, very well respected, very well known. So I knew science, but I didn't understand ecosystem health, ecotoxicology, all of those kinds of things. But I was there more as I would say, a coach to them than another technical expert. And during that time is when I went through my coaching certification because I felt the best leader that I could be for for that team at the time was to be a coach. I said, I can't tell them what to do. 
because they know their they know their science way more than I ever will. They're teaching me on climate change, but I can actually be a coach and help them grow and help them actually fill their full potential. So the scientists and then the technicians that reported into them, and then after spending a couple of of really really interesting and and fun years with that team, I got loaned to the UN, the International Civil Aviation Organization where I was an aviation security and safety consultant. And then I got exposed to the global perspective. So taking to accounts different realities, North America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Pacific, and really learning how to be effective in a highly politicized organization. If you think about the UN, the World Health Organization, I feel for them because they're in a highly politicized context with lots of pressures coming from, you know, member states, stakeholders, in their case, scientists, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's actually really complex. But again, it, it got me to, to learn about leadership at that global, global scale. And then after having spent about uh, 10 years in the federal government and the, and the global, global agencies, I decided to move into leadership full time. So I switched careers. So I went from scientist to managing scientists, to then working on working on leadership as a coach for a small regional organization. So I went from global to more regional, and that wasn't really a fit for me, and then joined another organization that had a larger scale, and then got back into a global role, I would say about, about 10 years ago, where I get the chance now to be a coach full-time, coaching executive team, coaching leaders, different industries across the globe, and really sort of bringing my psychology background, my management leadership background when I manage teams and manage large-scale global projects, and actually working with clients and kind of using that and having it come through my coaching. So that's a little bit of my, of my journey, uh, Dennis. What a fascinating background. Wow. So you're working with a whole lot of scientists. With, with, so, you know, you're talking about working with the brain and understanding the brain and, and trying to get learning from that. But then also working with with a group of people who have uh, got some super brains and out there as scientists as well. That, well. that must have been really fascinating. And then going from there into a leadership side of things as a leader of those scientists and then going into actually going to do some leadership things yourself. Uh, really amazing. And tell me something. When you talked about the global scale of leadership, when you look at leadership from – region to region, country to country, does it differ? I mean, is leadership different in, a, in another region to, to another one, or is it, is it the same across the globe? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, because there's a couple of things that I've come to learn about leadership. Is One is leaders, if you talk about the, the human level, if you talk about the person, there's going to be a lot of similarities in leaders across the gr- the globe, right? They'll be thinking about the same things. They'll be focused on about, you know, they'll be focused on their people. They'll be focused on the deliverables. They'll be focused on their clients or their, their key stakeholders. So they'll be thinking about the same things and they'll be focused on similar things and they'll kind of behave in similar ways. So that's sort of, sort of the common, the common field where it starts to get different. And, and it's both, at a regional level, so where am I, where am I actually implementing or executing my leadership? But really, it's at the organizational level that we see the biggest difference because leadership is context dependent. See, mm. we used to in the in the seventies and the eighties, we were looking for the profile of the strong leader. So once you know, this was when psychometric assessment tools were super popular, and let's study hundreds of leaders and let's come up with the one profile that shows strong leadership. It turned out that strong leadership had myriad profiles, right? There wasn't one profile, it was a whole bunch of profiles. But what happens is with whatever profile we happen to have, so you will have your profile based on your history, your style, your education, your experience, I will have my profile based on on all those things. So we'll have very strong leadership, but here's the thing, that leadership will not be great in every context, mm. whether it's region, specifically organizations. It's really, that's where the differences come up. So then what we need to do, both as coaches and as leaders, is find, okay, where is the field of play 
where my leadership will really hit the sweet spot. And so really finding that match. At the same time, how do I evolve my leadership so that if I do change context, COVID being one example where all of our contexts have changed, how do I evolve my leadership over time so that it can now fit this different context, mm. right? So the context will be regionally different but will be organizationally different, but will also be contextually different because now COVID is asking of all of us as leaders very different things than it did before. So how do we adjust and evolve as leadership as the context, as you know, continuously changes? So that's both the challenge and the opportunity of both the coaching side. How do I help you know the leaders figure out what their sweet spot is and also figure out, well, how do I evolve it because the context is continuously changing and then doing that for myself as a leader saying, okay, well, what is my sweet spot now? What was my sweet spot five years ago? And how do I need to evolve my leadership so that it's going to be continuously effective as the context changes? So it's, it's a really sort of relatively complex question, but one which I think is at the heart of leadership. So there is not one leadership mm. profile that's going to work everywhere. We have to continuously adapt whether we change organizations or regions or not, because guess what? The context is always changing. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing that is constant, right? Is change is changing all the time. And so we have to try and, and adapt. However, I, I like what you said too before about the fact that as humans though, you know, going around the world, humans are humans. As leaders, we are humans. We like look after our people and so forth. Then we've got the layer of cultures. There's different cultures. Yeah. And then you've got, as you said, what you've just said around the context side of things and so forth. So there it is, can be very complex, as you said, while also trying to meet demands, while trying to meet uh, yes. deadlines and things like that. And then for yes. a lot of leaders, if you're sitting here and listening to this, you'd be thinking, mm, why would you want to be a leader? <laughs> it's so <laughs> difficult, right? I mean, some people might think that. Yes. So yes. yeah, I've... I've um, yeah. So, hey, listeners, I'm here with Dr. Alex Vincent, and we're talking about leadership is changing, and um, he's sharing some great wisdom and insights here. Alex, who is your favorite leader? Now, this person could be alive or from history. So, who is your favorite leader, and why? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I kind of thought about that a little bit because I have a few favorites, right? So, I don't have just one favorite. I have a few, but one which I'd like to point to is Sarah Blakely, and Sarah Blakely is the founder and owner of Sparks which is a, a woman's uh, apparel company. And, and I'll just use her as an example of, you know, the leaders that I tend to appreciate. One of the things that Sarah comes across when, when she speaks is she's very authentic. She's very real. So she'll share her story in a very open way. And, and she'll be really upfront about, you know, how she launched her company, how she created a company, and all the work that she did to actually get there. And you also get the sense that she's a very people-oriented person. So what she talks about is you really have to love your clients. And I really love that, that perspective because I think about clients in a bunch of different ways. So there's the actual clients that I work with. And I love them in a way where I really want them to succeed, right? I'm literally like the coach. If you if you think about Jorgen Klub, you know, the Liverpool coach, they just they just won. You can tell that he really loves his players. He really wants them to succeed. He really wants them to do well. Sarah's the same way. And I think the modern leader or the modern coach or whatever, I think really wants their clients, their team members, their stakeholders to succeed, right? And I love that message about really love your clients. And I take that really love your team members and love them in a way where you're there for them and you, you want the best for them. And then that authenticity and that vulnerability, hmm. I think is, so before COVID, I think that was always important, right? I think that was always, that came up through a whole bunch of the evolution of leadership where it's evolved into the positive psychology, giving positive feedback, really helping team members get the best out of them. But I think along with that, because that could be more of like the carrot, the carrot, the carrot, the carrot. But I think along with that, we have to be ourselves. We have to be authentic. We have to be who we are. And we have to be vulnerable so that we can actually connect 
See, I think if you talk about love your clients, love your team members, you actually have to connect with them. And I think the only way you can connect with another person is to actually make yourself vulnerable. You actually have to open yourself up so that the other person is going to open themselves up and you can connect with them at a personal level where you can really get to know them and where you can really say, we're going to do this together. We're in this together. It's going to be really hard. It's going to be really cool. It's going to be really exciting. And we're going to see what we can get done. And what I, what I love about Liverpool's coach who said, you know, it isn't about winning. It is really about how do we want to win and how do we go about failing, right? So there's this whole thing about being humble Sometimes we're going to win. Sometimes we're going to lose. We're not going to win all the time. We're not going to succeed all the time. But how do we want to go about winning? How do we want to go about failing? Let's experiment. Let's try different things. Let's expand ourselves. So I think all, all the leaders that I appreciate, whether it's Sarah or Jurgen or other leaders that I appreciate, have those characteristics where they are able to really connect, they really care for, and they really want what's best for their clients or for their team members, or for their organization, and to say, you know, it's my job to set things up in such a way that I get the best out of all of this group of people that I'm working with. Wow, love it. So how to connect and make yourself, by, by, by making yourself vulnerable as a leader, and then also it's not about winning, it's about how to win, and even maybe how to lose, but it's about the way we go about it. About it. Yeah. yeah, it's really important. Yeah. Hey, Alex, that's great. So, yeah, you know, the show is called Leadership is Changing. And when I say that statement, what, what does that mean for you? Well, it's a little bit, you know, what I've pointed to. So I think, I think leadership has evolved, at least since I've been thinking about it and writing about it and working through it. And I think now, I think, and I think leadership has changed and I think it's continuing to change. So, you know, like I mentioned, if, if we go back, it was, okay, who's, who's the perfect leader? Let's, you know, let's find what the characteristics are and let's emulate those characteristics. We found eh, that doesn't work. In fact, all of us can be great leaders if we find what's part of our DNA, if you will, our, D, our DNA leadership, and we can learn to be great leaders. So it's actually learned behavior. So you're not born with it. You can actually work on stuff and become better, right? So that was the whole debate. And I think it's evolved over time where it was, you know, leaders were the taskmaster and I got to be tough on people because that's going to give me the best out of them. And that kind of worked for a while in the context that that started to appear. And you can think about sports where they kind of emulated each other for a while. And then they started to realize that, no, no, the way to motivate people and the way to get the best out of people is to actually give them positive feedback, like what's working well, what are their strengths? Let's, you know, the whole build on your strengths movement, Mm -hmm. right? So I think that kind of led to a change. Now what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is now the vulnerability is coming into the equation. The authenticity is coming. It's been, it was kind of in the background, right? We had Jack Ma of Alibaba fame talking about that EQ was always way more important than IQ, right? So that started to kind of come out being more vulnerable, being more authentic. And now more recently, so this is a more recent phenomenon, and I think maybe a little bit before COVID, but it's really sort of come up really since, is we actually need leaders that show way more empathy and way more compassion. And the reason why that's important is because there's actually a great equation that I saw in a book by Norman Fisher. So I highly recommend reading Norman Fisher. He's actually a really interesting person. And what he talks about is to really understand another person. And I think that's part of connecting with somebody, right? You really have to understand them. And I think to be an effective leader, you have to understand the people you lead, right? And there's a whole bunch, there's movies where we see that, there's TV shows, and then leaders that are effective, they really understand the people that they work with. And the two components of understanding, one is empathy. So I need to understand what you're going through, and I need to kind of put myself in your shoes and really kind of get a sense of, hmm, What's it like for Dennis to be in this role in this organization and to really understand that? But on top of so empathy isn't enough, right? Because we spent a lot of time on EQ is is really a, a lot about empathy, right? And what Norman Fisher is saying, yeah, that's necessary but not s- sufficient. What you need on top of empathy is compassion. You actually mm-hmm. need to care about 
what they're going through. And you actually need to care about how Dennis feels about what he's going through. So not just understand what you're going through, but also care about you as you're going through it and actually care about how you feel about it, whether you're excited or whether you're challenged or whether you're frustrated. And those two things, and I've just written about that, the article just came out this week, on creating a culture of empathy and compassion, which is actually a big component of psychological safety, which I've been writing about recently and thinking about. So how do we can create an environment where leaders are empathetic and compassionate, but where all people are? So you create a culture of empathy and compassion, because I think that's what's going to get the best out of people. And yet, we haven't really talked about it. We, I mean, we, th- we talk about it and think about it in very different contexts, but we don't talk about it or think about it or try to live it in organizational contexts because it's, it's all about numbers. It's all about yep. you think, 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 think. And now it's like, no, you got to bring your heart. You got to bring compassion. You got to bring empathy. And they're going, one of the great quotes is when I, when I sort of mention this to some clients and uh, you know, one person said, Alex, I'm an engineer. I don't know about empathy or compassion, but I realize that this is important and I need, you know, I, and I need to start doing something about it because we never really talk about it or think about it. So I think it has changed. And I think now it's, it's going into this dimension, which is much more humanistic and much more sort of person to person and really connecting at that compassion level. I think it's amazing, but I think it's it's what's calling us moving forward. Yeah, and I remember just a few years ago working with a leadership team of executives, more around the research and development side side of things for an organization. And these guys, in 10 years, had never, ever got together face-to-face as a leadership team. Why? Because their executive vice president said, because we are engineers, we're not leaders. And so the new executive vice president brought them together just based on what you're saying there, Alex. It's so true, so important. So a organization that doesn't have the, the compassion and the empathy, and, and maybe if we think about the pandemic that people have gone through, I, I think those leaders who have shown it versus those leaders that haven't shown it, well, have you seen anything like that? And, and what's been sort of like the response of people who do show it and those who haven't shown it, in particular through the, the times of pandemic? Well, I think that's that's a really good question. So I think what's, what's happened is, you know, when things were going really, really well, right, we've known, you know, growth for the past many years. This was across industries, across different regions of the globe. Leaders could get away with being okay. You know, mm-hmm. I could be an okay leader and still be effective because the results are going to be there, Going, we're going to do well. Then when the, when the pandemic hit, it required things that were really, really different from leaders because all of a sudden people were working from home and all of a sudden the people's personal context started to appear in their work context because they weren't physically separated. And then I was hearing from leaders, it's like, Alex, I'm having conversations about people's family life which mm. I never heard about before, but now I'm not just talking about it because I'm actually seeing a little bit of it on video. I'm actually seeing a little bit of it. And now they're talking to me about their challenges they're facing on their on the home front, the kids being home all the time, maybe family members that are ill, or maybe they had ill parents. And now it's a lot more concerning. They actually, they actually started to see that if they didn't have the empathy and the compassion going in, it was actually being required of them more and more by their team members. And they're saying, I'm realizing I'm being asked something of me that was never asked of me before. And I'm not quite sure how to how to bring this out, but it's being required of me moving forward. And I think those that were able to realize it and started to work on it, being more vulnerable, being more authentic, being more empathetic, started to become more effective. And those that didn't see it and didn't adjust started to become less effective Wow. And the organizations are now seeing the leaders that are really rising to the occasion and the leaders that are kind of floundering. And, yeah. and they can be in the same organizations and they're starting to notice those that are able to bring it because all of a sudden it's being asked of them and they kind of had it in them, but it was never required of them. And those that don't have in it, don't really care and aren't bringing it. And so they're starting to flounder. And so it's becoming way more obvious 
which direction their leaders are going in. And there will be leaders that will actually grow through this and actually become better leaders. And those that were kind of okay, they're actually going downhill. It's actually not not going in a positive direction for them. And now there's no place to hide as, no. as a leader. You can't hide in any of this. Yeah, so it's a good question uh, that you put on the table, Dennis. Uh, it's interesting because, I mean, it's it's almost like they've gone into a virtual world and we're having to use Zoom or cameras and things like that now to see each other. So it's almost like we've gone away from each other into a virtual scenario to let the guard down, yes. which is really quite interesting. And then the other one is I remember uh, this terminology from years ago, and it's just so true right now, just based on what you're saying, Alex. Hire the tech, hire the touch. In other words, the higher the technology, in other words, what we're experiencing right now because of this pandemic, we're having yeah. to do this. We're having yeah. to do more of the higher, the higher the touch to be around the people to get to know them more. It's fascinating how it's just working out like that. Yeah, and I think I think what you're pointing to is is really sort of the the core of it. I think it was always true, but now it's become super obvious and super explicit. We need much more high touch leaders than we ever have in the past. And I think the organizations that will recruit and develop the higher touch leaders, I think those leaders will be more valuable. I think they will add more value to their teams, to their organizations, mm -hmm. and to the clients. And I think all of us as leaders have to realize, okay, I might be, I might be relatively strong on empathy, compassion, vulnerability, authenticity, all of those things. But wherever I'm at, I'm going to have to raise all of those <laughs> moving forward. So I yep. could be at an eight. I'm probably going to have to be a nine. Or if I'm a, at a nine, I'm going to have to be at, And if I'm at a two, I better get to a five, you know, as quickly as I can. Because I think it, I think when the COVID, you know, when the pandemic kind of goes away, because eventually it will, there'll be a vaccine or, you know, something, something will kind of diminish its impact. That requirement will still be there. Those leadership characteristics will still be important. And in fact, maybe more important post-pandemic hmm. and organizations that are actually doing the return to work and stuff, they're starting to realize they need even more empathy because some people don't want to go back to work because they're worried. Why are they worried? Let's have that empathy conversation. Let's have that compassionate conversation. What's going on for you? So they're realizing they might even need it more post than during. So it's yeah. really interesting. I'm finding it really interesting. Yeah, so what I'm finding is that some of the leaders that I'm actually coaching with who are now going back, because in this part of the world, we've actually come out of lockdown and we've gone back into back into the workplace and people are slowly going back into the office. They're actually struggling. They're finding it quite difficult. And so, A, from actually doing it, again, being around other people, but emotionally, they're drained. Yeah. And because yes. they've been giving, 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 and now they've gone back, and now they're having to give more because they're trying to help people get back and, and balance. So it's really interesting to see how that works. So, and this is so this is where the two are coming together. So people need to know that they're going to be physically safe, right? When they get, then when they return to work, right? So is there going to be distancing? Is there going to be masks? And organizations are really good at that, right? You, you know, we've worked with organizations and others have worked with organizations that where physical safety, they're on top of it. Accident rates are really low, all that stuff. Here's the thing. That's not going to be enough because people now want to feel psychologically safe. Mm. They want to feel that whatever emotion they're going to feel that if, if they don't feel super comfortable going back to work, that it's okay for them to talk to their boss to say, you know what, Dennis, I'm not so I get everything. You know, we're putting in the hand sanitizers and the masks and everything. And I still don't feel safe. It's got to be okay for them to say that. And it's got to be okay to have that conversation. So it's one of those unique times where physical safety and psychological safety are coming together. And organizations say, we're doing everything we can on the physical side. And it's not enough. That's right. It's not enough because people on top of that have to feel psychologically safe, not just that they're going to be okay physically, but that they can talk about how they're feeling and having that be okay. And that if they want to take a little bit longer or they want to come in for shorter periods of time or, or whatever, that that's going to be okay for them to express that. So this is a really interesting kind of time, not just in the history of virus pandemic, but also I think in terms of leadership, I think it's a, it's a sort of seminal moment that we're all going through as leaders 
Yeah, excellent. Oh, wow. Some really cool things being shared here on this show today with Dr. Alex Vincent, who we're talking through around Leadership is Changing. Alex, how has your business or industry changed and, and how what impact or demand has that put on you? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of things. So, you know, some of the work that we were doing, we were doing in working with teams, we would work with them live. So there would be a, a lot of the work that I would do would be done with groups in person, right? And obviously, when all the flights got canceled, and, and there was lots of concern around people going together, uh, being together for longer periods of time, it was really transforming into a virtual model. And so now, all of the things that I do that I would do in person. So if I was coaching a team live and in person, I'm now doing the coaching through technology, whether it's Zoom or, or, or Microsoft Teams. And in fact, I always did a little bit of it virtually, and it's just now doing more of it virtually. It actually works quite well. It's more, it's not so much on the coaching side, right? So on the coaching side, I've, I've used technology for a long time, webinars, et cetera. So I was actually relatively comfortable with it. But some, some organizations are saying, nah, we're not sure about that virtual stuff. Yeah, we kind of know, but it's not going to be the same. And what's it going to look like? So we actually had to do some demos for some of our clients. And these were clients that were pretty sophisticated technology-wise. But whenever it got to training it was like or development, it was like, Ugh, how's that going to work? So I've actually done some demos to kind of you know, again, make the clients feel comfortable, make make the people feel comfortable that it's going to be different, yes, and will still be effective. And so that's that's one thing. And I think the other thing is some some clients are just gonna continue to continue to go down that road. And some clients are saying, well, we're gonna do this until we can get back together. Again, whatever they're comfortable with, we will adjust. So I think for us it's it's required a lot of a, a lot of adjustment that way. In terms yeah. of, okay, do they want to go virtual now moving forward? Do we want to go virtual for a piece and then and then come back face-to-face? So those kinds of things have happened. What's been interesting is coaching has really taken off in a big way. So coaching was always something that was quite popular. But what they found was that leaders needed, at least in this period of time, was that one-on-one coaching. And so coaching has really increased in terms of, Let's get leaders support. Let's help them through this. So that's really gone gone through in a, in a big way. And the other thing is some organizations. So there's the whole concept where we have an organizational culture, which is fair weather culture. So everything's going well. It's not raining. It's not snowing. We're good. Then winter came in the form of a pandemic. And all of a sudden they realized okay, our org culture was not built for winter. And so now some organizations are realizing that this could be a time, well, it's almost like we don't have a choice. We're now confronted with it. How do we recreate? How do we evolve our culture? Again, part of it could be psychological safety. Part of it could be giving each other honest feedback. How are we going to innovate through this? How are we going to get through the other side of this? as financials might be hit, as projects might be hit, as clients might be hit, and really thinking about things different in a different way and really coming together hmm. as an organization, they're starting to realize. So those are kind of the shifts that I've been noticing with, with clients that I've been talking to or working with. Yeah, so build your organization's culture for all seasons, not just for yeah, the right. seasons that are good or easy. Is that, yeah, for all seasons. Hey, Alex, if there was one thing you could change in business as a leader today, what what would that one thing be? Yeah, so I think it would be sort of the theme is really to have leaders create spaces that are psychologically safe. I think that leaders think about their leadership and they'll and they'll think about their teams and they'll think about their clients but i think not enough energy or focus has been spent i would say for the most part i'm not going to say everybody but i would say for the most part on creating an, an environment where people can be at their best so think about it that environment now might include people working from home that could be part of the environment right i'm talking when i'm talking about environment i'm talking about the context i'm talking about the ecosystem it almost goes back to my days when i was managing science, scientists and climate change 
where they would talk about ecosystem health and they would analyze the health of an ecosystem. So I'm saying, can you create an ecosystem where the people in your organizations can be at their best so that the ecosystem is super healthy so that all of the life in that ecosystem will thrive. So mm. it's almost that metaphor coming back where it's like, okay, can I create an environment where people will be at their best and that everybody can thrive? So this adds diversity and inclusion to the mix as well. Doesn't matter what role they're in. Doesn't matter what background they're in. Doesn't matter where they come from. Can we make an ecosystem healthy for everybody and inclusive of everybody so everybody could be at their best? That's what I wish for organizations and leaders uh, for 2020 and beyond. Create an environment where people can be at their best and thrive. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah. So yeah, something for a lot of organizations and leaders to think about for sure. How, how is, um, talking about employees, how, how has employees' expectations changed? Well, I think they are expecting much more of this than ever before. So they're expecting their leaders to bring that vulnerability, to bring that authenticity, to bring that empathy and compassion. They're expecting that more. They're expecting their leaders to be great coaches. They're mm. expecting their team members to be great team members. So in fact, more and more now talent is looking at the leader and saying, okay, is that the type of leader that I'm looking for? So coach, empathetic, vulnerable, positive, but they're also like, so I can have a great coach, but if all my team members are all not yep. very cool, not very supportive, not very positive. That's not really going to be helpful to have a leader who's great and a team that's not. So they're also looking at the team members now and saying, are these teammates that I want to play with, are they positive? Are they vulnerable? Are they authentic? So I think now the demands are much, much higher. And now they're adding, is this an ecosystem that's healthy? Is this a place? So the team could be great. The coach could be great. But is this a field of play that's great where we can be at our best, where I can be at my best, where we will all win together? I think the requirements are way higher than they've ever, than they've ever been. And talent will always choose where they're going to play. They will. And yeah. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be that. And it's going to be got a great leader that you're going to work with. You got great teammates you're going to work with. You've got broader teammates that are going to be great. And you also have a field of play that's really going to allow you to be at your best. I'll tell you, those requirements are going to be there for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like they're looking for the full package. They want the whole thing. And even if we look at a sporting scenario and you're looking at talent in the sports field, they will choose where they want to play. Yeah, and, uh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, Alex, uh, what makes a leader successful in this fast-paced, ever-changing world? What's what's you know, some things that make them successful? So I, yeah. So I think a couple of things. I, again, I think these were things that were were always part of the mix, and I just think they've taken on taken on more importance. So I think one thing is leaders who are self-aware, and I think in order to be self-aware, requires requires that humility of saying none of us none of us are perfect. All of us have areas of strengths. All of us have areas for us to pay attention to and to develop. So I think really good self-awareness, which means taking time to reflect, taking time to reflect on who they are as a leader, what's really important to them, what they're bringing to the table, what they want to bring to the table, and how they're actually going to go about developing whatever they need to develop. So that means with that self-awareness, actually taking action and getting support, whether it's getting support from peers, getting support from their boss, getting support from a coach, whatever it is, is saying, okay, I need, I, you know, I want to work on this. I choose to work on this. It's important to me. I want to develop as a leader. So let me, let me go and get some support. So I think that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing I think is having honest adult dialogue with people. And so this means that with my teammates, with my bosses, with my colleagues, with my clients, is to be able to have adult conversations, which means, you know, we're really going to talk about the way things are, and we might get, you know, we might get upset, or we might get emotional, or we might get frustrated, or whatever, 
but let's talk about what's going on. Let's talk about what the issues are and let's find a way forward together. And knowing that it's okay to have that open, honest dialogue about how things are working. And if they're working great, let's talk about that too. Let's let's celebrate that too. And so I think the self-reflection, the self-awareness and being able to have a conversation, hmm. maybe an uncomfortable conversation or a crucial conversation, what I call it adult dialogue. Can we have an adult conversation about what's going on? I think I think we need to get there. And I think we need to get there in a consistent way, not just sometimes, I think all the time. You know, let's have that honest, open dialogue where we can talk about stuff and figure stuff out and let's move forward. I, I think, yeah, I think that's what's that's that was always the case. And I think it's just it's just taken on more importance now. Great. So two things. One is self-awareness. The other one is to be able to have that adult conversation, whether it's uh, an easy one or a tough one, but at least have that conversation for sure. Alex, you know, based on your experience around with scientists and then also your experience around the world, working with leaders and so forth, if I was to ask you to get out a crystal ball and start thinking about the future, where would you see leadership going in the next five years? I think I think leaders are going to be required to bring different things than they have in the past. I think they're going to be expected to bring these things. And it's not just, we hope that you're going to bring these things, or we want you to bring these things, or no, no, we expect you to come in and bring all of these things that we've talked about during this conversation. I think it's going to be an expectation. But I think, I also think the leaders are going to expect it from themselves. So I think a lot of it before was, well, the organization expects me to bring this, so I'm going to develop it and bring it, or my team members are expecting me to bring this, or my clients are expecting me to bring this. I think it's going to be a lot more self-generated. So I think leaders will expect it of themselves. They will say, I'm not above rolling up my sleeves and working with the team. I'm not above challenging the team because I think they have way more potential than they show. I think they will come in expecting it of themselves. So I think whether the organization says, Dennis, I expect this, 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 and this from you as a leader, they're going to come in and say, okay, here's what I'm going to bring. Here's what I expect from myself. I expect to get the best out of everybody. I will come in with vulnerability and with compassion, and with authenticity, and I'm going to demonstrate it day after day after day. I think that's the other thing as well. I think leaders would bring out these things when required, and that was okay, and that was, you know, that was acceptable. I think now it's going to be, no, 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 no. It's going to be day in, day out. It's going to be pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, plus whatever's going to show up in 2021, plus whatever's going to show up in 2022. So no matter what the conditions are, it's almost going back to what, what we talked about before, no matter what the conditions are, you're going to continue to bring these things day in and day out, no matter who your teammates are, no matter who your clients are, no matter what's going on, you're going to bring these things in a consistent way. So I think expecting it of themselves, bringing it day in and day out at, at a consistent level, I think that's the way it's shifting, and it's going to be not even a requirement. It's just going to be an expectation that everybody's going to have, and we're going to have to to figure out how to do that uh, for ourselves. Yeah, take control, show up, and bring your A game. How you come along to it and bring it day in and day out, but on a consistent basis, that's awesome. Dr. Alex Vincent, hey, Alex, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. It's been a pleasure to have you here. If our listeners are wanting to get hold of you or even see some of these articles that you've talked about in our show today, well, what's the best way to do that for them to actually see to, to see those articles and we'll, we'll make contact with you? Yeah, the, so the best way to reach me is on LinkedIn. So Alex Vincent on LinkedIn is the easiest way to find me and all the articles I've posted on LinkedIn, so they're easily accessible for folks. Awesome, thank you. What we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Change is incredibly scary, especially with the unknown and the unfamiliar territory. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing. Hey, check out the episodes as they're being published and released. Download them, uh, listen to them, subscribe to the channel, uh, to the Leadership is Changing uh, program, 
and put a review and, and a rating. If there's any feedback you'd like to give me on the show, or if there's a question you want me to ask my uh, my guests, or if there's a question you want to ask me in my episode, ask Dennis. Feel free to send me an email, dennis at leadingchangepartners.com. Hey, thanks for tuning in today. We'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world. 